I want to thank Cassie and Jeremiah and Alexandra. It's nervous energy they spend up here, I hope you know. But they did a wonderful job today. And thanks, too, to the Heritage Singer Reprise Group. Um, we're, I don't think we're really allowed to use that name, so I just call us Reprise. And I think they should be flattered, really. Um, that's, that's my opinion on that. Uh, it would be a lot more convincing because we actually have an ex-heritage singer in our midst who refuses to join us, and that's a V.J. Perry. I don't know if you know her, but she sang with the group for a time. It would be really fun to get her involved. Well, thank you to Milt for covering for me last week. Um, I uh, spent a very meaningful Sabbath revisiting a church I pastored 18 years ago, uh, and I haven't been back since. So it was quite something to be invited back for the 125th anniversary of that church and to hear a bit about the way God has led through the years, starting back in the 1800s and going back to the time in which that church was built in a downtown location in a manner that was so grand, Ellen White found it necessary to criticize <laughs> the gross expenditure uh, that they had put forth on that, that downtown tabernacle that they built with Moses Church. There weren't a lot of us former pastors back. Uh, the pastor I worked with was experiencing um, his very last day in ministry with his own congregation, 48 years in pastoral ministry. And so he's now retired. Anyway, it was a good time. I thank Milt for covering for me, and uh, it's good to be back. Before I left, I was engaged in a series on a reasonable faith. How many of you were able to get to at least one of those? Terrific. Uh, how many of you heard at least one of them that made sense to you? That's a much harder question to, to ask, but I'll take the chance. I'm glad that that's, that's so. I'm not continuing in that series, but there is something along uh, that line today that transitions us to something a little different. And this is a point of what I want to call relevancy. I want us to start thinking as a people about not just what we believe, but what we believe relative to the circumstances in which we find ourselves in this life together on this, on this earth. And I want us to start thinking in terms of how we communicate, what it is that we prioritize and how we communicate that. Um, because I think that's an extension of a reasonable faith, and I think it matters in terms of our young people, and I think it matters in terms of those of us, uh, those in the community who know nothing about us. So today we're going to take on just sort of a brief outline of God as creator. We're very familiar with these themes. I hope the couple of things that I just point to along the way will give you pause for thought or be new to you in some way, so listen for those. If there are none, I apologize. I'm glad you know everything I know, and that, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, but we start in John chapter 1, which was our gospel reading, and this incredible passage, this beautiful passage that's so often memorized and so often recited, this uh, uh, Gnostic gospel, if you will, this one that's different from all of the others, this one that stands out, so poetic and so beautiful, connected not just to Genesis 1, but connected to Revelation 1 and Hebrews 1. It's a marvel in its own right. In the beginning was the Word, capital W. Now, you've heard this a million times. Bear with me. And the Word, capital W, was with God, capital G. And the Word was God. So we start out with a kind of mystical theological statement being known as the Word who is one with God and is God. He was with God in the beginning. And there's that word, beginning. I don't know what that means for God. In fact, theologically, we say God has no beginning and no end. He's eternal. He's everlasting, always has been, always will be, always. That's what we say. So when we refer to the beginning, I think we must be referring to the beginning of what we know as existence. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Now I want to hit really quickly that through him. 
we have a theological vision of creation ex nihilo, we say, out of nothing. And not only is it out of nothing, it is an abracadabra moment because not only is what is made from without nothing, but it's spoken into being. Let there be. Let there be. If we think theologically this way or philosophically this way, we come to some interesting questions, and I'm not going to take time to get to some of those today. But that particular idea is not really present in all of the texts. There are things that give flesh and dimension to that idea that I think are worth, worth considering. And this phrase, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made, is more intimate than your children were made through you. Your children were not made because of a word you spoke, although you speak words that have power and generative importance. They create realities. Your children were made through you, although you have nothing to do with the mystery of how that happened. You didn't design the zygotes. Zygotes, you didn't bring them together. You didn't cause the cell divisions. You didn't weave together in a mother's womb a child. It just happened. It was embedded in your nature. It was embedded in what it meant to be a human. When God made, he embedded the capacity for you to make others through you. And it says in John, all things were made through him. I don't want to make too much of that. It's always problematic when we make too much of single words. And yet I want you to file that away with what we're going to look at in the bulk of our text this morning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 14, the word, capital W, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Again, much has been made of this theologically, very heavy sorts of theology. The nature of God. What is God? How do we describe this apparent multiplicity of persons? How do we describe the nature we call triune? What do we mean in Trinity and three and one? How do we, how do we get our, our minds around Father, Son, and Spirit? Well, those aren't the questions I'm primarily asking today. But I am pointing out that God through Son, earth through Son created. And so here we have this image that's more than magic show, more than abstraction, more than automation, more than mechanistic, more than God just saying. We have something intimate. God through the Word, creating all that is through Himself. We move to Hebrews. I want to hit that before we get too far away from it. It really could be the most, uh, the last text we look at, but I think it's. Uh, acceptable to put it in right now and, and uh, look at the way in which it informs our thinking. 
It says in Hebrews 1, and again, I know this has been recently read, but I'll remind you, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. God acting through the son, bringing about all that is the son, having all things made through him, by him. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven and so became much superior to the angels as his name is inherited. The name he has is inherited as superior to theirs. For which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son? Today I've become your father, or I will be his father, and he will be my son. Mystery of divine relationship wrapped into a package, a language that we can sort of understand and appreciate of father and son, same in substance, derived, perhaps not, co-eternal, but somehow a relational description through which all things have come to be. It's as if the universe is birthed from God himself, God herself, from Christ, through Christ. Well, you get the idea. He is now, in Hebrews, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of all that is. It implies a relationship that's more than utilitarian. It describes a relationship that's more than speak and it is. It describes a relationship that's heavier than <coughs> magic show theatrics. And so we move to Genesis. We have two accounts of creation right there, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, each with their own variation. But I want to turn to 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. There's a beautiful cosmology here, and what I mean by that, it's a big word, is there's a reality construction of the universe, an understanding of the way things worked and were. It is not the cosmology that we have today. Our cosmology is informed by a photo taken from Apollo of this beautiful orb of blue with cloud and land. Our cosmology is formed around earth and sea and space around planetary revolutions, around a sun and so forth. This cosmology, from the writer's point of view, this earth construction was understood differently, but here is this primordial image of God over matter, hovering, seeding, organizing. And then God speaks, and so we have these generative speech acts, these creative speech acts, these these words that make things happen. Very powerful. When God speaks, things happen. But we get to something very interesting when we get to verse 20. Let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created great, the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Did you hear that? Let me repeat it. He creates the fish of the sea, the mammals of the sea, the creatures of the sea, the birds of the heaven. And what did he do? He blessed them. He said they were good, and he blessed them. 
And he commanded that they too be generative, they too be fruitful. He embedded within them the intelligence to perpetuate themselves, to recreate themselves, that from their kind they might bring forth others of their kind. Are we seeing something that we can hang on to? God, through the Son, brings forth the reality of creation and embeds within creation the capacity to bring forth its own kind. There's something beautiful happening. Verse 24, Let land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its time. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move on the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And he said, let us make humans, human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the, uh, and the, birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them, embedding within them the capacity to bring forth their own. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so we have this image of how things came to be. But in verse 24, this translation says, let the land produce living creatures. That will be meaningful to you in just a second when we turn to chapter 2 and look at Verse 7, chapter 2, verse 7 in Genesis. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Dust, breath, living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed. That should tell us something. And, of course, we hear this story of him learning what the tree of knowledge of good and evil is and so forth. We also learn that he sees that he's alone in this particular rendering of the creation story, looking for a helpmeet, a spouse, a corollary, not to find it. And God says in 18, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals. Did you catch that? Formed out of what? The ground, all the wild animals. What are we formed from? The ground. How did animals find their life? From the ground? Well, they were made from the ground as we were, but they were animated by the breath of God. They had... That given them as well. And then it talks about how humankind came, to, or how woman came to be. Now we have some interesting things happening in this. We have a process that's more intimate, maybe, on closer examination than we first thought. And we see maybe a greater connection between the earth as it's formed and the animals and the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and humankind as they're formed. And we see that God is sustainer, still intimate, intimately interested in this earth, and redeemer, still interested in fallen humanity. And we aren't particularly concerned with sharing this vision, message, or image. What we're concerned about is how long ago all this happened. Was it 6,000 years ago, according to the Usher chronology? 7, 8, 10, 30, 50, 150,000 years ago? Was it millions? Billions? This is the question we're asking. We're concerned that somehow commitment to Sabbath might slip 
if we don't have a creation story that we can read quite literally, six days, 6,000 years ago, seventh day is Sabbath. And while I think Sabbath is always relevant, and while I think we can maintain the Sabbath on many grounds apart from creation, in fact, in Deuteronomy, it's embedded in salvation, not creation. This is where the denomination has put its energies and its focus. And I wonder how many people in the world care whether the world is 6,000 years or 8,000 years or 10,000 years or 30,000 years. How many care? Some of you are falling asleep as I speak, so not even you care. Not interesting. We're interested in trying to bolster something that we've held as a supposition, as a propositional truth, out of rationalism, out of modernity, and we live in an age that is post-Christian. Let me say something about that. The number one growing religion in the world is none. Well, Islam, technically, but none. In the United States, the number one growth for religion is none. And people, are, as they read the Bible, they're frustrated by what they see. What they read when they read this text is that the normal order of things is that humankinds are derived from, come from woman, not man. But in this story, Eve is taken from man, even though man is taken from woman. They don't understand that when they read that. That's not beautiful to them. When they read this passage and they see, and God gave them dominion over it, to rule over it, they don't see a human species or Christians as those who think the human species belongs with the rest of the species. They see the human species as something that's been separated from and stands up and opposed to. And rather than seeing humans as morally responsible for creation and caring for it as God does, they see humans as seeing themselves as free to do whatever they want with creation. I can kick the dog. It's only a dog. I can club the baby seal to death. I need a jacket. I can run a pipeline from Canada through four different avenues down into the states because I need oil. I know, I sound like a bleeding heart liberal. <laughs> Forgive me. But I challenge you as a person, not as a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or a Green or a Libertarian or any of that, let it go. I challenge you as a human being created through God of earth, animated with His Spirit along with the rest of this place to give a minute's thought to what it meant when God says, I'm going to give you dominion. You're going to rule. He didn't mean to trash the place. He wasn't talking about mass extinctions of creatures. He wasn't talking about fracking. He wasn't talking about pillaging and raping. That's not the dominion he was looking for us to exert. He made us in his image so that we might tend and care for the garden that he placed us in the way he intended us to. He made us of earth because that's what we're connected to. The planet isn't just a thing that we're separate from. The ground gives rise to the creatures that inhabit it. That's what the text says. All things that were made were made through God, the Son. Birth, if you will, into existence. I'm worried about our relevance. I'm worried about our capacity to communicate to a world that wants 
so much something to hang on to, wants to be loved, wants to have something to believe, wants to be a part of a community, wants to have faith, wants to think of God as good and gracious. But when they meet Christians, they can't. They're evangelized, all right. None is the box they check once evangelized. We're busy over in our corner trying to decide, was it 6,000 years ago or not? Maybe for a couple of people, that's a worthy endeavor. I think theology is interesting. History is interesting. Trying to understand what the Bible is saying in generations is interesting. But the message of Genesis isn't just about Sabbath. The message of Genesis is that you are a special derivation of God himself, a special iteration, a special creation in his image, and that you were given a garden to tend. Me too. I'm saying you plural, you inclusive, just to be clear. I don't stand apart from the rest of you in this that we, collectively, we were given this, that caring for this place was given for us as a responsibility and a duty. And I wonder how well we've done that. I wonder how well. We can be relevant. We can speak to our times and the concerns of them. We, we can participate in the healing of humanity, not just through Christ's forgiveness of our sins and theirs and that gospel message, but through Christ's love and care for a world, not just the people of it, a world that he made, that he spoke, that he breathed into, that he touched, that he said was good, and that he wants to redeem is there any way, do you think, we can grow our story to include that kind of redemption? Is there any way we might speak in more relevant ways about what God has done? Is there any way that our testimony might be something other than man's dominance of woman, man's dominance of nature? Is there another story we have to tell? I think Genesis, Hebrews, John, the Psalms, I think they paint a different picture. But what is it that you're going to live and what is it that you're going to share? May God bless you as you figure that out along with the rest of us. Amen.